What up, y'all? This is the real Rick Ross. I'm giving a shout out to J Mix, Tupac Death Row Channel. Peace. This is a J Mix exclusive. <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead and get into it. Hey, I, I wanted to know in advance, is there any is there anything you want me to plug for you? No. No, no, I'm I'm good. <laughs> and you are doing me the favor. I hey, you know what? I do gotta ask about Voices Through the Vessels. Is that still coming? I know that's been around for years. But it, are we gonna ever see that? Probably not. You know, I'll probably do a record, but I don't think that a but I'd ever call it that. That that was something that Dre that was a Dre Dr. Dre idea. And I don't think Dre is gonna be really involved as much uh with the project. Um, I, I ask everybody this. Um, I'm sure you've been asked a million times, but uh who inspired you musically? Uh that was a uh there was a group of guys who really inspired me uh, as far as hip hop is concerned, but uh, uh, nobody more than Rakim, maybe. It was the guy that probably inspired me the most to want to be really good. Were there uh, were there artists other than rappers that inspired you? I read somewhere that you were inspired by. Uh, Parliament. Is that is that is that true? Parliament is not really my you know, that that wasn't really my I'm inspired by all kind of music, but if, if it were anybody in the R and B world it would be Marvin Gaye. Uh he's kinda like my my guy, my go to guy. Um, in the sense that I really connected with him artistically, uh uh, and uh, and you know kind of the 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 way that he really cared about his music and 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 the trouble he went through and how it came out in his music you know um, but, uh, but but other than him no I'd say most most of the guys were were rap artists. Fair enough. Um... Are there any artists out there, like the younger artists right now, that you're fucking with today? That you like? That you know what? I, I don't really, I don't even listen to music the same anymore. Uh, it's changed so much, so the way I listen to it changed. So it's hard for me to make that comment uh, because I don't buy it anymore and. Uh, you know, I listen to the same way that everybody else listens to it if it comes on radio or somebody plays it for me. Uh, but that being said, I don't discriminate against any of them. Uh, I, I support all of them, you know, in my own way. Uh, I don't want to turn into, you know, like my like my parents were. They thought the music we were doing was a piece of shit when they just didn't understand it. So I, I don't want to... You know, talk down on these young, young, young guys making money because it may be the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I spoke to Layla. He said something very similar. He said that uh, he said that it's it's the same thing like when our parents would tell us that 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 music's a fad. It's never going to last, and we loved it because me and you both come from the same era. And I thought I thought it was a, a very good analogy about artists today because some of the and this is just me talking. Some of the artists that I hear today that my, my kids listen to, I, I don't understand, it, and it makes me feel super old. But I I always, I always keep that in the back of my mind that, you know, uh, it's it's not for my generation anymore. Yeah. You know, they're on, they're, on a different, they're on a different deal, but everything is in cycles, right? So there are the artists out there that are uh, rooted in, you know, content, that's uh, that has some meat to it, you know. Uh, but just like anything else, the industry has got it. it, it it's turned into a money-driven thing, and so the machine 
will push what it wants to push to make its money, which is most of the time mindless sort of stuff. And so you're not really dealing with uh, uh, an individual mind when you're talking about popular music. Now you're working with the machine. Do you, do you feel do you feel that certain music today lacks a definitive message? Oh, absolutely. You know, but I mean, but who am I to give voice to to the, their music? That their message may be one I just don't get, uh, which is fuck the world. Let's just have some fuck, fuck everything, you know. Uh, um, but there are other guys out there, with, uh, Kendrick or or. You know, J. Cole, these kind of guys, Big Sean, some of these guys have real meat to their subject matter. And, you know, and uh, sometimes they go off on that other tangent. So, you know, they give you enough to enough to feed your soul and have fun. Do you feel that there's still room in the game for lyricists? Absolutely. I'd say, Kendrick, I'd say those three guys are lyricists. Yeah. Do you find it ironic that a guy from Dallas, Texas, will forever be associated with the West Coast? I don't find that that too odd at all. It's, uh, there are a lot of similarities in uh, the cities, you know. Uh, but my story is really it's hard to it's really hard to you know it's one of a it's a it's a once in a lifetime deal like if you ever run across another one of me i i find it hard to believe you know and so no i don't find it odd at all i just think that it's just uh just one of those things can you tell us where the name DOC come from? I know that it was originally Doc T, but how, how did you get that name? When I started, when, when uh, Easy's record came out, and uh, subsequently the NWA record came out, it felt like those guys were, uh, it felt like they were going out of their way to disassociate me from the work and so I added the periods to my name and made it because they had periods in their name you know and so they had an acronym I wanted one so that it would it would seem like the, the, the names were connected so somehow I could connect myself to that movement can you tell the fans out there, when you first realized that you had a knack for spitting and writing rhymes? Uh, there's, a, there's a game called The Dozen that kids play. You know, your mama this, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one guy used to really uh, get, get on me doing that shit so bad that uh, I did it out of... Uh, it was really out of uh, to try to keep myself from being totally laughed at by everybody, and it just turned out that I was good at it. You know, uh, I had always been a voracious reader as a as a little kid, and so uh, words came easy, and the, the type of verbiage that I used made people's eyebrows raised, and they and they really got into it, and so the more they liked it. Uh, the more it made me want to be good at it, so I immediately started writing all of my shit down and and uh, committing it to memory uh, super early. You know, like I just like to have raps already ready in my head, so I wrote all the time and memorized. How did that turn into kind of formulating with the Philip Fresh crew? Well, one one of the guys, uh, one of the guys in the Philip Fresh crew was a dancer originally, and uh, he had a dance group. He asked me if I could write an intro to uh, 
uh, the, the, the show for their dance group. And I wrote it, and none of those guys could rap it. So I, I ended up having to rap it myself, introducing them. And uh, a guy at a local radio station saw it and thought that it was really special and asked if we wanted to make a group. Well, that guy ended up knowing Dr. Dre, and that's how it all kind of started. Now, the stories are kind of legendary, and it's the only Dre question I had. Um, but can you tell us about that actually linking up with Dre and uh, the reason that you kind of left that Phil Fresh crew and, and went solo? Can, can you give us a brief well, down of that? I thought uh, when Dre came to Dallas, he came to visit that guy I was telling you about. Is it? He's a DJ for a local radio station. His name is Dr. Rock. He had belonged to uh, the, the world-class working crew, DJ crew in L.A. And uh, he knew those guys, all of them, Lonzo and Dre. And all them. So he invited Dre down because he was doing really well on the radio here. Dre met me, saw me, and heard me rapping. He was like, wow, you know, you might be the best person I've ever heard. If you were in California, we'd be rich. And uh, the feeling pressure wasn't really doing that well. And I didn't really understand the business or trust the, uh, the guy I rocked very much. And uh, so about six months later, uh, I dropped out of high school. My mother told me that she was going to send me to the Army. And so rather than go to the Army, I hopped on a plane. I called Dre. And uh, said, you know, do you still want to hook up? And he said, yeah. And I hopped on a plane and went to L.A. How did that turn to you uh, writing music for N.W.A.? Well, when I first got to L.A., uh, it took about maybe a week or so before we went to the studio. The first day I went in, Dre put up a beat. He asked me to write a song. That song was We Want Easy. We recorded that song that day. And after that day, it was just like, that was just, it, you know, I guess nothing else had to be said. You know, every, it was just on, on and popping. It took about a week before uh, We Want Easy was everywhere, you know. And after that, there was no turning back. This is not about me. I just want to provide some context to the question that I'm asking. Easy Does It was the first tape that I ever bought. And it was also, uh, coincidentally, the first CD that I ever bought. Um, one of my favorite songs is uh, Still Talking Sh the intro. And you were credited in writing that. Was that just a spur-of-the-moment thing? No. I was always good at, at the downtown kind of stuff. You know, the the slower tempo stuff, the funky stuff. Was I was always really good at it. And so uh you know, it wasn't it wasn't a spur of the moment thing, it's just you try to put the beat on and I'll write the rap. Can I ask the inspiration for the uh this the skit on it the, where he goes, I could do the boogaloo. Oh, that's uh that's cube. Uh we were just acting a fool, man. We were just having fun. It's crazy because me and my brother, we have a, a love for hip-hop, and that is that's one of our favorite favorite skits. We clown each other with that. Is it true that Easy he couldn't write a rap to save his life? Couldn't write, he couldn't write a rap to save his, his life. He had no talent. But you he had, a, Go ahead, I'm he had like what you would call uh, uh, the the whatever the it is that stars have. He has that, you know, something about him made him dope. His voice was really cool, and the character he was, the swag he had, was super dope. You know, so we built around that. For those out there that only hear stories about Easy. Um, you knew him. 
what was he like as a person? Is he the... Man, I, guess, I guess he was cool. I, I, I don't like to get into, you know, like I wasn't his friend as much as those other guys was his, was his friend. I was like an employee of his and he didn't, you know, uh, he didn't do 100% by me. So, so I don't want to get too, too far into what type of person I think he is, but, um, he's an average guy. He was funny, you know, and, and, you know, he liked the ladies and he was a strong person. He was a thug guy. He was a gangster dude. I, it was 100% real. He was a dope dealer. You know, so if you if you take a step back and think about what a what a what a dope what a drug dealer would be like, then, then that's him. You know, it's it's kill or be killed. It's uh, I'm gonna fuck you before you fuck me, and I'm gonna have all the power and. You know, it's 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 not fun and games. It's re, it's real real shit. You know. I guess that was the point to it. I guess uh, really the the answer that I was looking for was was the gangster persona real? What oh yeah, no question about that. <laughs> you now uh, earlier you had brought up uh, writing "We Want Easy." Was it your goal with that song to make a radio friendly single? Absolutely. That's the only way. I, that was my, I, that was when I got to California and, and I knew that they needed help. I thought that that was the help that they needed. Like you couldn't get on radio with the records they were making. And radio in California during that time didn't even like to play rap, period. Much less the, the, the gangster rapping, you know. So... For me, it was important to be able to make easy records that were funny and entertaining and cool, but still have a, a, a slight edge to it, you know? So, yeah, that was exactly what We, we Want Easy was about, to get him on the radio. Because once you got him on the radio, that was it. Now, when it comes to your album, Nobody Does It Better, how did you, how did you complete this album while writing so much material for other people. Yeah, I'm not told, like I said before, I, I wrote all the time, you know. I, I was voracious uh, on planes when, when we were touring on the buses. You know, I stayed up all night and and uh, 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 while I was writing their albums, writing my own stuff, you know, and so... You know, and it, at, that, at that time, it was coming out like water. It was just easy. Was there ever a situation where you wrote a verse for someone else, and then after, I guess it had been recorded or released, that you wish that you had kept it for yourself? No. No, because usually when I wrote for someone else, it was something that I probably wouldn't say. That's a great answer. How did that? You surprised me with that. So you, did you did you get get got yourself in the mindset of uh, what what you thought that maybe they would say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's 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 what you're. Well, that, from my perspective, that's what you do. You're writing for their character, so it's something. It has to come from them. It has to feel like them. And, Speaking of Nobody Does It Better, uh, The Formula is my favorite track. Mine, uh, too. Oh, that's, that's what's up, man. It, it is a great song. Uh, I'll stop kissing your ass, but it, it really is uh, a great song. Well, I'm a Marvin Gaye guy. I told you. That's my guy. <laughs> yes. Um, I've heard, uh, actually I read it on Wikipedia, that the only reason you got a parental advisory sticker put on it was because of the song The Grand Finale. Yeah, I, probably. My question for that was, at that time, because I think that a lot of people in this generation don't realize the attack that was happening on that, on gangster-type music um, with Dan Quayle um, in, the, in the 
late eighties, early nineties. Was that to you, was that detrimental to get that label on there or was that something of a certain kind of credibility to get the parental advisory label on there? You know, and I never looked at it like that. I always considered myself a part of that band. You know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't in NWA, but but I was. You know, so uh, the sticker just uh, on my record made it made sense to me. You know what I mean? Because it, I, I was cussing every now and then, and but more importantly. From my perspective, I was a part of that group. I was a part of that movement. You know, the police came from me. Mm. Did you ever expect the impact that the album Nobody Does It Better would make? And did you did you expect the impact that it would have on up and coming artists? And did you ever get any props from people that that surprised you that liked that album? You know, I, I had no clue. Uh, thinking back on it, I had no clue that I was that good. You know, I didn't know. Uh, I was just having fun, and, but I wanted to be great, you know. But thinking back on it today, I very possibly, very possibly could have been the best to ever do this you know I had things been different you know because no one could do it better I wasn't even trying we were just kind of around I hadn't found my voice yet I wasn't talking about anything except I'm good you know uh, I hadn't found the subject that I'm passionate about so my, my songs were only just bragging about how good I, I can write you know, um, but thinking back on it, I had all the tools to be one of, if not the best to ever do this period, you know, and so, no, it doesn't surprise me when, when people uh, give me credit for being good, I, I was, you know. A lot of people freaked out when Jay Z put put the name in the record, and and I don't think it's any different than uh, Twister putting it in his record, or uh, Red Man putting it in his record, or Kendrick putting it in the Taylor Swift record. It's like it's all cool, and I take it as a compliment that they see that they know what I know, that I love my, I loved it just as much as they did. I worked just as hard as they did, and we were all sort of on the same plateau. I, I'm sorry for science. I, I'm kind of debating something, and you can shoot me down on this, but uh, do you feel that substance abuse maybe derailed your career a little bit? Absolutely. No question about it. Horrible choices by a kid that just didn't know any better, you know? And uh, it's just a blessing that I'm still here to talk about it, you know? And so the path was really difficult, but the fault was my own, you know? I can't blame anybody for it, uh, for drinking and driving and taking drugs and shit like that. That's, that's no bueno, you know? No way in hell I should have been doing that. Uh, and what happened to me was a was a direct result of that. And nobody's to blame except me. And so the path that I've had to walk ever since then has been really tough. Um, but, you know, I'm still here. And even though after I had that wreck, it took every bit of the alcohol and drugs to keep me moving, to keep me from wanting to blow my brains out of some shit. Uh, Today, I'm a I'm a thankful person to have made it through the other end of that. Would it be appropriate to ask you if you had a message to those struggling with uh, abuse problems? You know what? Uh, 
It's really difficult, bro. It's it's a hard, like it's a, like like the classes say, it's a disease, and you have to treat it as such. You know, you have to really seek help because uh, you can't do it by yourself. Uh, like I said, it's it's a it's a god thing for me because it just took the time. It took almost 20, it took 25 years for me to find, it took 25 years and then them finally locking me up for a year before I decided, okay, it's time to do something else. Have you been able to maintain your sobriety? I'm not, I'm not sober in, in terms of, uh, in alcoholic terms today. But I don't do anything the way I used to. You know, my my uh, things that are important to me now are a little different. So I don't I don't do anything the way I used to. Um, uh, but I'm not chasing sobriety like uh, like an alcoholic would. You know, uh, I'm I'm chasing something else. Uh, but but. Like they, they say in the class, those that can go out and drink and do it the right way, they salute you. And that that's me. I can go out. I, I don't have to have it the way I used to. So if I have a beer every now and then, it, you know, it, it's all good. But it's, I don't drink to lose myself anymore. I don't drink to, to get away from being D.O.C., um, or to get away from feeling any pain anymore. Now I have everything about me is driven now. I have a focus. There's something I want, and it's a little bit more difficult because of the circumstance, but it's it's totally attainable, and the story can even be greater if I can pull it off. And I don't even want to say if. I want to say when I pull it off because it's not a DLC thing. It's a, it's a G.O.D. thing. Would you tell us about meeting Suge Knight and your relationship with him? I met Suge shortly after I got to California. He was a friend of uh, the guy. It was a guy named L.A. Dre. His brother, when I first moved to California, Dre was living with his aunt. He didn't have a place for me to sleep. So L.A. Dre, his brother, let me sleep on his couch. And uh, Shug was a friend of L.A. Dre. And Shug was a good guy. He's funny. He's a big guy, you know. But, but he was fun. He was funny. We hung out. We'd get drunk. He'd get me in the clubs. And we were, you know, we were thick as thieves in the beginning, bro. Uh, and it, But it got... It got it didn't really get dark and ugly until after the accident. And, you know, that's when the gangbang shit started and she turned foul, you know. But Suge and I were, were really close for a while. Is it true you guys got kicked out of almost every single club in LA? Every single club in Hollywood. They wouldn't let us in anymore. Like, we'd walk up and they'd be like, nope, not tonight, guys. You know, we, we were bad. And that was me losing control, you know what I mean, drinking too much. And the drugs hadn't started then, but I was getting way wasted uh, drinking in these clubs for no reason other than I was unsure about where I was and who I was and what I was doing. And success had come so fast. And, you know, it, um, for a 21-year-old kid to go from nothing to everything in like nine months, it was just too much for me to handle. On a personal level, is he the big bad wolf that people make him out to be? Well, that's two sides to that guy. Uh, and yeah, he can definitely be a, the big bad wolf, no question about that. Um, but like every person, he's got a good side. And to some people, I'm sure the good side outweighs the bad side, you know. But uh, he definitely got he definitely got some um, some checkers in his past that that aren't aren't that fucking cool. 
one, the funniest story I ever heard, uh, Go Mac told me about Suge Knight knocking out Crazy D. You know that story? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he told me he knocked him out. He just socked him. He just popped him. You know what I mean? It, and I felt bad about that because um, the guy was with me, and he didn't know that I knew Crazy D. He thought that Crazy D was being disrespectful to me. <laughs> Oh wow! I didn't know. I didn't know that. Uh, that what I, I had heard that Crazy D said, uh, "You're a big dude. I'll just go get my brother." And and Shook socked him and said, uh, "Go get him." Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> um, so that was a misunderstanding. Yeah, I thought it was. It wasn't. The guy was in my dressing room or some shit. And- You know, and Crazy D was just being funny. Like, he's a joke, joke, joke. He's a guy that tells jokes a lot. That's his thing. Do you have an opinion on what's happening with Shook now? Do you think he's being targeted for who he is rather than what he's done? Well, Shook, hey, man, Shook is crazy. He's, he's burned up a lot of bridges, man. You know, he's did a lot of, a lot of shit that, like karma of a bitch, bro. So I wouldn't wish what shit is going through on anybody. It's no, it's no bueno. Um, but that said, you know that dude. He made a lot of choices, and, and now I think what's happening is he's um, those choices are coming back to. Uh, um, he's gonna, he's having to pay a price for those choices. <laughs> Just like any other human being, bro. We do these, we make these choices, and in the moment, we feel invincible, and we're young, and we're gonna be rich forever, and we're gonna, you know, be 30 years old forever. But life changes, and and shit happens, and so, you know, um, I, I hope that things, that it's not the case. His story doesn't end just totally f***ed up like that. Maybe, you know, but it's all bad. I agree. Uh, I think that, uh, I think if he wouldn't have, if he wasn't Shug Knight, if that was anybody else in the situation, they wouldn't be in that situation, if that makes sense. Did you like the Straight Outta Compton movie? I thought it was a great movie. The writing was a little uh, funny, you know, and uh, he didn't expect the story to be truthful or uh, a serious depiction about uh, anything important, right? It's just a, it's a movie made for commercial success, and in, in that respect, it was a great movie. I enjoyed it. Uh, the question about how they portrayed me, uh, you know, I, it was an NWA movie, right? So I don't know how to really respond to that. Obviously, I did a lot more for that movement than the movie would, would lead you to believe. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do? You know, it was an NWA movie, and to those guys, I wasn't in NWA. I think uh, they had to put me in the movie because everybody knows I was there and did the work, you know. But when you look at the guy on the screen, I, I, I don't think he said 10 words, you know. Were you pleased with the way uh, Marlon Yates played you for the 10 words you yeah. said. Yeah, Marlon, Marlon Gates was cool. Is there anything you think, besides, I mean, besides the, the obvious role that you played, which I think that a lot of true fans do know the role that you played, but is there something that you think should have been told in that movie that didn't, that wasn't told? <laughs> no. I think if that's the way they wanted to tell that story, then 
Um, and they should have got it out just the way they did. And like I said, I went to the movies and saw it with my girl, and I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie. Can you tell us when you knew that Death Row Records was going to blow up? Because you were there, part of the inception. <laughs> was there ever a moment where you're like, oh, shit, this is going to take off? When everything that we were making, and when I say we, I mean Dre and me, was at a level like Easy Does It, that album. No one could do it uh, uh, straight out of Compton. No one could do it better. The Chronic. All of those, all of those albums are really great classic albums. So I expected the, the, the success to continue the way that it was going. You know what I mean? And that's what it did, right? Like the money got bigger and better and and the guys were bigger and better stars, but that's that's the nature of any business. It's gonna grow and grow and grow. But the music, the level the level of greatness of the art was the same. It was consistently really good. So I, I, I expected the success to be, you know, consistent. Uh, you said in a previous interview, I believe it was with Vlad, uh, that you may have not at first heard the talent or the superstar that was in Snoop. At what point? I didn't hear it. I wasn't so sure about it like Dre was in the beginning. What point did that change? Well, it didn't take long. You know, um, we started spending time together, and I could I could see it. Snoop started really focusing on song building, and his personality really started to shine through. You know, and I could see what Dre saw, and so. Then I put all my effort into helping Snoop become that guy. Nothing But a G Thing is one of the most definitive West Coast classics, and you wrote it. I helped Snoop write it. Was it did you write, did you hear the beat to it, or was it? Yeah. Me? Can you take a second? We had the beat. Dre, Dre gave us, we were at Dre's. They made the beat. Snoop was living with me at the time. <clears throat> and uh, we take the beat on and have a writing session. I'd stay downstairs. He'd, he'd be upstairs. And he'd write. I'd write. He'd come downstairs. I'd spit mine. He'd spit his. I'd be like, you know what? That's really good. But this part right here isn't really good. Like, you should do these these parts over, and you should move this line from down here up here, because if you start it like this, blah, 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 you see how it brings the listener in, blah, 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 and take out three, these three lines and replace it with something that goes like this, blah, 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 and that's how we built the record. I have to ask about 20-sack pyramid. It's my second favorite cut on that album. It's the funniest uh, I have ever heard. Can you tell us about that, that day and how yeah, that man. came to be? Where did that idea yeah. come from? Man, who knows, man. We were smoking so much marijuana, man. And so we were high as hell and probably drunk and just having fun. The same thing with uh, still talking, you know, just having fun. The same thing with the courtroom scene on the police, just having fun. You stated that uh, death row is a rough place to be. Would you care to elaborate or, or talk about that? I've heard the show just kind of, kind of made sure nobody up with you. Um, yeah, I think, I think, are the stories true? I mean, are the 
the stories of yeah. the studio yeah, it was downs a, and punishments. It was, a lot of, it was a lot of it. It was bad. A lot of, a lot of red room. A lot of, a lot of beatings in the red room. I don't want to incriminate anybody, but that, that was the reason they called it the red room. I tell you that. Mm. Can you can you tell me uh, why they call it the red room? Is it, are you referring to like blood, or are you referring to the affiliation? Yeah, I'm talking about blood. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year inducted NWA. This year, they're going to end up Tupac. How do you feel about that process? Do you think that it's mainstream America coming around? Or would you feel that it would be the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame kind of riding the wave of recent success? That's hard to say. You know, I, I can't get into the mind of, the, of that academy. I'm not a, like, uh, I'm sort of a realist, right? And so I understand that the, the way this country works is is pretty divided along the lines of race and money. And so either somebody with a lot of money wanted that or stands to, to make a lot from it um, or... Uh, you know, it's a reason. It's a reason to keep race relations sort of in the same stereotypical place. <laughs> if all you do is promote the, if all you do is, is promote the, uh, then most people just keep seeing these young boys as. Uh, doesn't matter how you glorify it, you know, because. Uh, the police are still killing boys in the streets the same way in 2017 as N.W.A. was telling you in 1989, 88. And nobody's talking about that. Shit. Matter of fact, that you never you did a whole movie about it, and that and at a time when it was really going on, it seemed every other day or so, and nobody ever mentioned it. So. Like the way America works is is based on a sort of a a false narrative um, uh, that works for a TV show or uh, and so doing the right thing by people don't work in in that in that particular TV show. If you can understand what I'm saying. I do. Well, were you ever a victim of police brutality, or did you have any bad experiences with the uh, Compton Police Department? Never with the Compton Police Department, but I don't think you can be black in L.A. and not have some sort of dealing with the police, you know. But most of the time, no, man, you know, because, I, like, I was a good kid. I wasn't a thug. Didn't carry myself like one, you know. Uh, I, I was never anywhere I wasn't supposed to be. But luckily, I did a lot of drinking and driving and never got caught. You know, a lot of being high in a car and never got caught. So uh, probably got away with a lot of. <clears throat> but I'm not a crime, not a criminal minded guy, I'm not a drug. You know, well, so I don't think think like those guys think, and I don't re um, have actions or reactions like those guys do. So most police would probably roll up on me and know better. Because I, I had uh, brought up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and this year's inductee Tupac, I've never heard you speak on him. Uh, you knew Tupac, correct? Yeah. How, how did you first meet Pac? I met Pac uh, when my record first came out. He was with the Digital Underground. He was being, he was doing record. He was doing shows with uh, Shock G and, and uh, Money B. And so well, I was around him, but 
he wasn't really very, you know, he wasn't talkative to me. And so I wasn't very talkative to him. And it wasn't until he got off on his own and really started, not even during his uh, Interscope stuff with Brenda's Got a Baby, you know, uh, we weren't really cool. But after he, him and a friend of mine named MC Bree were really close. And so uh, I spent a lot of time around him when he and Bree were together. And we hung out, you know, but we weren't especially cool one way or the other. What do you think? Because he's been blown up and been, he's been called the greatest of all time. What do, you, what do you think that people get wrong about Pac for what you knew of him? You know what? I don't. I don't. I don't know what people get right or wrong. Where Pac is, is concerned, I think he was an extremely talented human being. I think it's a waste that that kid died young, um, because he had a lot to give. You know, I don't think he was a bad guy. I don't think he was a criminal-minded guy. Uh. I don't think he deserved what he got, you know. Were you disappointed when you heard him uh, start to diss Dr. Dre after Dre left uh, Death Row? <laughs> no, because I know that wasn't coming from him. That was coming from Shug. Do you know what that falling out was between Shug and Dre? Was it just a money thing? Uh... I think Dre, I think it was a power thing, right? Um, Suge is a, is a, first of all, Suge is a bully, you know, and so, and you're not gonna just bully Dre up to a certain, you know, and he'll tolerate you if he's making money, but to a certain extent, after a certain extent, he's gonna be like, F this, you know, and that's what it was, probably. But I don't think Dre and Suge were, were really super compatible even to begin with, you know, and no sooner than we we all started doing business together, that started to fall apart. Did you introduce the two? Uh, yeah. Were you the one that brought them together for uh, their new venture? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it was our new venture, right? But uh, I was just going through too much in that time and I couldn't hold on to I couldn't make I couldn't make good business decisions and I certainly couldn't make good street guy decisions. You know, so yeah, I played I played a a significant part in, in pulling that whole thing together and building it up and structuring it the artist and Music and the songs, yeah, I did a lot of work, you know, but doing the work is what kept me alive. It was like my reason for being in that moment, and I wasn't thinking of it in terms of this is my business, I'm going to get rich. I was I was thinking in terms of I need to do this shit to, to be able to get up in the morning, you know, and so, and then when the, the, the gangbang shit got really over the top, and it was just, oh, my God, you know, it was a, just a bad place to be. How did you feel when you uh, heard Hit Him Up for the first time? Uh, I thought it was a good record. You know, I, I, I never got into the beach, and I'm a Biggie small guy, you know, so <laughs> nobody's going to, like, Biggie Smalls was one of my guys. <laughs> And so I'm listening to things purely from the, uh, purely as an MC, not a rapper. And so Big, Biggie to me was a pure MC, and I always really admired that uh, about him. Now Tupac was a hell of a rapper, um, and a super fucking talented guy. Um, and he had, and he could have been an MC. Uh, but he didn't give a fuck about him saying he, you know, truth was his thing. And so it wasn't the art in his 
music that 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 he pushed from my perspective. It was the truth, whatever that may be. That niggas is getting shitted on, or that niggas got guns, or that uh, things are this way or that way. Whereas Biggie Smalls was pure artistry in the way he gave you the information he wanted you to have. And I, I connected to that. So I thought Hit Him Up was dope as <laughs> Why did you end up leaving the label, that, uh, Death Row? Well, with the things had gotten so bad, those guys were winning. The money was going up, and I wasn't getting getting any of it. I couldn't bring myself to sue no, anybody. You know what I mean? Like it was too much. It was too much death. It was too much uh, violence, and 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 it was just it was too much going on for me to to, to try to lawyer up and sue those guys to pay me. You know what I mean? Uh, I didn't feel safe taking that approach. So I just left. Were you able to stay friends with Suge Knight during that uh, fallout between him and Dre, or did you separate yourself from the situation altogether? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't hold any animosity towards any of those guys in my past because I made those choices. They didn't make them for me. And, uh, but would I, would I hold the same kind of relationship with them? No. Am I going to go hang out with you? Probably not. You know, but I don't have anything against him. Dre has a different story. Uh, Dre and I still aren't on the best of terms, but you never know. He and I are we're hot and cold, you know. Um, some days it's not good. Some days it's pretty good. And you never know what that guy, he might call us like anything. And now we're back best friends and want to be around each other all the time, but you never know. Do you know what happened with Detox? Because you, you, you helped to work on that quite a bit, didn't you? Yeah, the record just wasn't good. Wasn't good. Now, there was a time uh, when Trey was making records with this dude named Slim the Monster. It was a time during that period, probably early, Oh, I don't know, oh five, maybe oh, yeah, oh five, maybe oh seven in that area when the songs were actually, in my opinion, he was on something and if he'd have kept that, kept going that route, he could have came out with it, you know, but he would have had to have leaned on Thunder Mobster and I don't think he wanted to do that. I don't know. You know, but the songs are really good in that period. Other than that, all the other time wrapped around making that record. They were just making records. They they just didn't have it. That's my opinion. You think it was just missing a standout hit or the all most of the work was just not just not there? It just wasn't it. Yeah, it wasn't it. You know, it didn't have that it didn't have it. There was a, like a, a couple of years ago, uh, about a year ago now, people were excited because they heard you, they heard you on the mic again. They, heard, I mean, they, they heard, they said that your voice has improved. Are you, are you working on anything? Would you be opposed to trying to put another project out? Is that I'm going to put a record out. I'm going to put a record out uh, and I'm working on it. You know, I got about three or four songs that I really like. And, uh, but I, I don't know about the new voice. You know, I think it's a novel. I think it's a, it's a beautiful dream and it's a, uh, uh, it's a sure sign that God is still in the miracle business. Um, but when I rap, It feels better to rap like this. You know, it, it feels like it's starting to feel like this voice, I, that, that I have this voice for a reason, that this voice 
is the voice I'm supposed to be using. I just have to figure out how to make it sound the way I need it to sound. And I got one song that it that it's so good on that I know I can make an album doing it. You know what I mean? It's just gonna take work. It takes time and it takes money. You know what I mean? It takes money that I don't have. Uh, to get in a, re- a place with with something, uh, some you know, the kind of quality I need to be able to make the sound that it's going to take for me to be a success. But I got a couple songs with uh, some of the old school guys that I've hung out with that are really good. Uh, I got a couple songs on me that are really good. I got a song with me and my wife that's really good. So I'm building Right, and I don't want to give it all away now, but I'm working on something really special. And if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, and if I'm blessed, which I have been, probably by the fall of this year, you'll start hearing about it. It's super cool. It's it. I think it'll be it'll be well worth all the time that it took me to get back to this point. Because right now I'm focused. And I want to make great records. You know what I mean? It's, uh, and I don't, I don't get high all the time. I don't get drunk all the time. Now it's more important to sound dope to make, than to than to get dope. <laughs> Kill me, <laughs> sir. Uh, the last question I got for you. There's a lot of fans out there that are going to be super excited to read and uh, hear some sound bites from this interview. Do you have a message for them? Yeah, man, uh, life happens for a reason, man, you know, and embrace it. It's super short, right? But uh, everything that happened to me in my past happened for a purpose. And so the testimony is, if you can be patient and believe anything is possible, absolutely anything is possible. If I could take this raggedy voice and turn it into a story of redemption and power, Shh, buddy, come on. Like I was telling, uh, I was talking to Sir Jinx the other day, and we were talking about a DLC biopic, mm-hmm. and I said one of the most classic because I've already started writing this thing, right? One of the most classic moments of this piece is when I am back home in Dallas after being defeated, defeated by the world, you know, and this beautiful young woman named Erica Badu picks me back up and loves me so hard that I have to love myself. She gives me a baby and I go back into the game and come out with a victory. Can you imagine? Every woman in the world is going to be like, wow. They're going to love that. Oh, it's so beautiful. They're going to love that. I want you to know, all bullshit, I've been a fan for a very long time, and I appreciate all the music that you brought us. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you very much. Yeah.